therapist. I'm just kidding. This is what, 27? Yeah. 20. Oh, I thought you were going to do a blooper. I turned it off already. It's already on? Oh. Oh, fuck it. I'm 20. Dead. 27, 28, same thing. Here we go. Salud. Salud. Mm. And we're back, episode 28, and we have, man, I'm kind of scared for this one because this is very, it's going to be a professional one, so no drinking today. It's <laughs> like, so we have Amber Castro in the house. <laughs> Round of applause, everybody, everybody in town, yep, we got you. <laughs> Amber, how old are you? I am 28 years old. 28? Yes, I'm old. No, no, not at all. I'm what, 20... 25. Everyone, anyway, what do you do? I Well, I we have an idea because you are a little bit of everywhere right now. Yes, I am. So a little bit of background on what I do. As of last week, I was working at a nonprofit organization contracted through LA County Department of Mental Health. Um, that agency is called Pacific Clinic. So as about a week ago, I stopped working there because I had to move into internship because I am in a master's program right now for school to become a therapist. So what I was doing there was a lot of case management is what mm, it's called. Nice. And as a mental health worker, because I worked as a mental health worker and case manager, I was doing both roles. So as a case manager, what you do is you help people in the community with resources that they need. So Correct. I was helping out with like unemployment, helping out with food banks, helping out just with different resources to like IHSS or if people needed homes or like transitional living, I was wow. doing that stuff with like older adult clients versus like as a mental health worker, you do a lot of rehab skill building. So it's not like therapy, but it, in a somewhat way, it kind no of way. is you work directly underneath therapists. So you're teaching your clients a lot of like that rehab and the skill building. So coping skills, communication skills, maladaptive behaviors. So it was kind of just a range of like everywhere what I was doing, honestly. <laughs> wow. Just because this is very important. Hold yes. on. Oh, yes. Microphone. We got to put Let your point not. across. Don't worry. I told Justin the same <laughs> thing when he was on. I was like, bro, you got to talk. But what what brought you into that industry or that field of work? Because that's one, that's not an easy field to work. And second, it is very rewarding, I would say, right? It, I'll definitely say that it's a tough field. You do see and hear a lot of unfortunate things that happen, especially because I work um, in an outpatient program for children. So it's a child intensive outpatient program. So you have kids from like two years old all the way to like 19 years old. So you hear and see a lot of different, different things that can be kind of sad. I'll say that. But to kind of bring it all full circle, I first got my first taste of like psychology and that field when I was 17 years old in high school. It was my senior year. I was taking a class. Mind you, the teacher in that class did not like me. She would purposely get the Marine recruiters to get me out of the class because she didn't like cheerleaders and I was a cheerleader. So she would purposely get me out of class because she didn't want me in there. But anyways, I ended up liking the class, but I swore to myself that I would never go through like the clinical part of it. And fast forward 10 years later, here I am doing the clinical part. Shout out to that teacher. Yes. <laughs> Which we saw each other on an IEP about a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Well, I was just having this conversation earlier with Josh, actually, that life goes in a circle, right? And there's always people that wish, sadly, the worst upon you and your future and think you won't amount to everything or to anything. And then life comes in a circle. And then, blessfully and everything, you're in a position to where people look at you and be like, you made it. Or you're in that position. Mm -hmm. And how we were saying earlier, like, People think and they'll say once you're, you made it into a sense, they're like, dude, I always believed you had the potential, mm -hmm. your work ethic. And it's like, whoa, 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 you weren't there. Very true. And, and I'll say it very much so. Uh, the people that support you in the beginning aren't going to always be there for you in the end. Um, so you definitely have your, and I'm sure you've seen it, right? Like with this business that you got going on, yeah. people aren't going to be there for you like all the way through. And I'll say it too, even like with my partner, like with his business, it was kind of hard to see his goal and where he was trying to go. So it does come full circle in the end. You just got to have, um, you know, that hope and just continue to move forward. Don't give up. Like 
it's been said in the other podcasts as well. Yeah, episode 26. 26. 26. Yeah. You got <laughs> you need you need to go watch that one to to understand it, but uh so going back on that did throughout your journey, right? Cuz you've been in that field for how long now? It's been 2 years. Um and then before that I was doing um ABA and community integration so we were contracted through the san gabriel valley regional center so Mm. unfortunately a lot of things happened there too so it was a series of unfortunate events that kind of led us to have to leave that place um we were let go there's a lot of unethical things that were going on so i've been like around like this field of like mental health or like helping out children with like disabilities for about three years now. Three years. Yeah. So the reason I ask is because how we just said, right, that people that support you at the beginning won't always support you. So Mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask, and again, the people that watch this, you know, before we keep going, like, share, subscribe, because it's going. And, uh, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of people, not just females, also males, but they're in the age group of like 20 to 30, right? Both Mm -hmm. of, both of our age group and almost everybody we had here are around that same age. If not, I think the youngest one was Jose at 22. Yeah, 22. He's still a baby. But uh, <laughs> getting into this field, right? Because this field, again, it's not easy. It's not for everybody. And what kind of relationships did you have to break? Friends? Like, did you have to go through something like that to really continue in this field or even enter this field? So one of the things that you learn in this field is setting boundaries, and that can be one of the hardest things, especially in a Hispanic community when you're a a female, um, right? Because you're learned to be a people pleaser, to kind of put everyone ahead of you, put everyone before, like, your own needs. So it's very hard to ever have a voice or a say in what you want to do. And so that kind of goes along and is portrayed later in your relationships or, like, in your interpersonal relationships, too. So... Yeah, I definitely had instances where, you know, I kind of had to take a step back and realize, you know, these people aren't for me. Um, They're not here in my best interest and I need to do what's best for me at this point and set that boundary. So I've done that a lot in this past year and lost a lot of people. I don't really have friends. The 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 few five. Yeah. Sorry, not sorry. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. (laughs) I mean, I love my five people. They all are onto bigger and better things in life, are either married, have children, live far away. So I don't get to see those people very much. It's like I say, my significant other, Justin, is my best friend. That's my go-to person. Shut up. (laughs) He's Shout right there. He's, He's right, right there. there. He's my manager. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just say, like, I I don't really have any other friends. So he knows, like, I go to him to vent a lot about a lot of things, and he's seen me lose a lot of friends, like, in the process as well. Unfortunately, I think that's sadly it's like a it's a norm normal thing to happen, right? When you want to get better, do better, do something different out of the ordinary, right? We're all meant to go to school, go to work, get a family live happily ever after things don't really go that way right now day and age i mean we all wish but it doesn't go that way but when something small changes something it could be small but have a big impact people start falling off or they say you changed Mm -hmm. and i think that's what i went through that's what a lot of other people have gone through but a lot of people don't want to cut that loose end Mm -hmm. they they're like "Ah, i know this person isn't good for me but I don't want to let go yet, or they still care about me. It's kind of like codependent relationships that we learn about a lot in mental health. When you're so used to a codependent relationship, and I don't know if you've ever been in this or like anyone here has been involved in a codependent relationship, you're so dependent of that person, the happiness that you get from that person, that you feel like you'll never find that anywhere else. So you have, you're used to that. So you have no other choice but to like stay there. I mean, you do have the choice to walk away, but it takes a lot for a person to be able to walk away and say, you know, this isn't for me. Yeah. But because we're so used to the same things over and over again, the same type of relationships, you you stay. Unfortunately, that ends up hurting you more later on down the line. So what, what right into it, what advice would you give someone to that's struggling with that? I mean, there's guys and girls, not, I think... For, what we all like to think is just only girls go through it. No guys, and it's only girls because girls are that way. But in reality, like, there's guys that have to go through that too or go through that. They just maybe don't portray it, don't show it. But both there's always both genders that have to go through that. 
do you have anything or something that maybe had worked for you that you can, they'll hear you out and be like, fuck, that is it. That is what I need to hear. So just to clarify, you're asking, um, is there any advice that I would give anyone about like codependent friendships, yeah. relationships? Someone comes up to you and asks you for help. I would just, and like, let's say if it was a friend and I've had friends in the same situation and friends who are still in the same situation, it doesn't matter how many times I tell you to walk away. You're only going to walk away when you know it's best. When you've hit rock bottom and you know, like, this is enough is when it's time to walk away. That person will screw you over many times over and over again. And no matter how many people tell you, like, dude, what are you doing? Walk away. It's not going to click until you allow it to click in your head what's going on. So I always tell people, I support you in anything that you do. Do you want my advice or do you want me to hear you? If they want my advice, I'll give them some advice. If they want me to hear them, I'll just hear them. But when it comes to a codependent relationship, I mean, only you know when it's time to walk away. And I say that every single time because I have plenty of friends who have been in that situation. And I say, it doesn't matter how many times I tell you, yeah. only you know. When you're ready, you're ready. When it's time to walk away. Yeah. And I, I was think like, it doesn't matter how many times people tell you, you know. Yeah. You know. That's what I think I was just mentioning to them earlier when we went to the gym. It was like, we can tell you, right? But Josh even said it, and I always say it, you're just not ready to have that conversation or exactly. you're not ready to really listen. Because exactly. we can have the conversation for the next hour mm -hmm. and walk out of here and you're just like, nope. It, every, nope. it went in through one year, out the other. Mm -hmm. Terco, son tercos. Exactly. And it's because, like you said, people don't want to have that conversation because it's an uncomfortable conversation. It is. Have. And that's kind of like what therapy is too, is being able to put yourself in a setting where you're going to talk about the uncomfortable feelings that have happened or that are going on. So, yeah, so... But it, there's... Um, Ash, Ashley Martinez said it. She has gone to therapy and everything, and she recommends it, right, to mm -hmm. people that are comfortable with it. But she said it because you're talking to someone who doesn't care about you, really. They're just, they're just getting paid to hear you out and give you a recommendation. That's not true. Mm. Not true at all. And I'll say this because I'm in therapy, and I know what it's like to sit on both sides of the table. Genuinely, we care about you. As mental health professionals, we go home and we think about you. We think about, are you okay? Like, I wonder how their parents are dealing with them. It's, sorry if my voice gets a little shaky, but it's true. Like, we really do care about you all at the end of the day and want the best for all of you. And you guys can even ask, like, my partner. I, I'm always talking about, like, therapy, like, when I'm in therapy. And it's, it's such a nice and liberating space to be able to talk about the traumas that you've been through in life or like trying to break intergenerational cycles, especially in Hispanic community. That's what we're trying to do, right? Not trying to be like how our parents were. Yeah. So therapy is not for everyone. Um, if you're willing to talk about that and open up yourself to talking about the difficulties of life, then I recommend it. If you're in a difficult space, I definitely recommend it. Um, but just know that the mental health professionals in your life actually do care about you and they shouldn't be giving you advice to begin with. Let's just say that. They're there to listen to you and help you process what's going on, not give advice. Mm. That's one of the big rules. We're well, not here to give advice. Oh, well, that's mm. something I personally didn't know. But uh, so piggybacking off of that, so you said all the mental health um, people that are in that industry really care. Do you think 100% that are in that industry are are in tune? Like I always say, invested. Invested with what they're doing. And how you said, there's people that, like, I coach my high school. And when I leave out of there, Brittany knows, I come home and I'm just bothered. Like, dude, this didn't work. Something is not going right with them personally. And I need to figure out how to fix this right now. Mm -hmm. And talk about it with my coaches. Next day, we go back to work. All right, let's fix this right now. And it's like, all right. I And I always say, after every season, I invested everything. There's nothing in that did not happen this season that I can leave there and be like, man, I didn't give it all. I invested everything. So when we did lose, say, hey, keep your head up. We did everything we possibly could. We got to the position. It didn't roll our way, unfortunately. Now just get back up and just keep working. Exactly. So that's that's the only reason I'm asking because it's like I've seen coaches, teachers, mm -hmm. um, managers in other industries that pff, they just don't really care. They're just there, collect the paycheck, move on, and, and get on to the next. There are some people like that. I'll admit that. Um, 
like the old, old OGs, psychologists and psychiatrists that are in this field just want money. And I'm going to say that because I've seen a lot of unethical things happen. They just want the money. They don't really care. They're going to diagnose you with like whatever they want. They're going to give you whatever medication they think is right. And they're not going to really be there for you to help you. And I say this because, for example, like my dad's psychiatrist. Oh, don't even get me started on her. She just irks me every single time that she does not care. She just wants to give him the medication and that's it. Just give him the medication. And it's difficult because there's other people like us, for example, in community mental health who genuinely care about our communities, our children, the parents, um, and educating them and giving them the resources while there's other people out here who just want the money. So I'll say not everyone is dedicated and for this field, but there are other people who really genuinely go home at the end of the day and really care about you and what we can do moving forward for your treatment. Going home, right? Now, how you said, when you go home, you take it with you. Did that, did you learn, did you need to learn how to balance that? Like how to keep work at work and, and home, home things at home, I guess you would say? Yeah, so one thing that I've learned to realize and one of my first professors in grad school said is at the end of the day, I wipe myself and I rid myself of all this negative energy that I've carried with me with all my clients all day. And I leave it to whatever higher power that they believe in or whatever mm. higher power I believe in. And I go home from being a therapist or mental health worker or peer partner or psychiatrist, whatever. And now I go into being the role of I'm a daughter, I'm a girlfriend, whatever it is. But it took me a while to very much understand. Like I couldn't bring that in because then I was like, trying to vent to my family and they're like, well, why don't you just do this? I'm like, oh, you don't understand that. Like, you can't do that in this field, like, unfortunately. And so it became very tough. And what became harder when the pandemic started was we were working remotely. So before I would have my time to drive from the office home and I would just decompress, listen to music, process everything that happened in the day. And like, was it a good day? Was it something heavy that I was carrying with me that a client told me? Cause you deal with kids who are suicidal kids who have had sexual abuse, who have been raped by family members, who have just been physically abused. You hear a lot of crazy, crazy things. Stories. So it's hard for you not to carry that with you. But yeah. when the pandemic began, all you would do is just close your laptop and that's it. Let me go to the kitchen, start helping out making dinner. And there was no time to decompress. So that became very difficult during this pandemic. Um, or even trying to help out these kids who were doing school from home. Like, oh my gosh, that was so difficult for them and parents. Like, and, yeah. and I feel for that. Like, nobody signed up to be a teacher. You know, you didn't go into this thinking like, hey, I'm going to have my kids. I'm going to be their teacher someday. Or these kids <laughs> were like, I'm going to yeah. be all tech savvy in the future, right? No, it, and then I think when that all happened, right? Because I have my little sister, Brittany has hers. And just watching, even one of my sisters, like, on her class, and I think even her first communion, right? That's what she did. They had online, and you're just watching parents, right? Because they're all on the camera, and they're, like, not even paying attention. I mean, the way I, when we came back and everything, the whole school happened, it was like, man, all these little kids lost, lost pretty much a whole year of interacting with other kids, getting away from home, mm -hmm. if you weren't attached to your parents, now you're super attached, yeah. getting up early because, I mean, you heard the stories of, of kids waking up, putting the laptop down, and boom, knocking mm -hmm. back out. And teachers are, some of them were hard because they're like, oh, you're not at the level you need to be. And it's like, mm -hmm. there's people that learn hands-on, and there's people that learn by listening and watching. I'm not one of those people. I need really need to be hands-on and even if I, when I was in college, I was falling asleep. <laughs> I was like, gosh, it bores me. Mm -hmm. But, again, that's not for everybody. These kids are the ones that suffer throughout those years. But what would, you probably know more, but throughout COVID, the suicidal rate or depression rate for younger kids was a lot higher than what it ever was. Yeah, it was. And it's, it's very sad because um, in the city that I worked in, for example, uh, at the main high school where most of our teens went, there was actual, uh, a kid passed away by attempt of suicide, unfortunately. And yeah. so some of our kids there knew this kid, and so they were really broken. And so it was very hard for the community because, I mean, it's crazy because you think about it like you're at home, these things are happening at home, and unfortunately you think like you see the signs, but you don't always see the signs every single time. No, I think it's... 
It's hard because what was it when I entered the program for our co- for coaching? It was in that same year. Uh, some somebody unfortunately took her life. It broke everybody, mm-hmm. and it's understandable, right? You people that are in close to the person, and as a young kid, you're not even an adult yet. Like as a kid, you're dealing with adult problems, which is the loss of a family member. Because I think. Uh, we sadly had to go through it. I mean, I was, what, second grade, third grade, and suffered a loss, a uh, great grandpa, but I didn't process it. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, you know, rest in peace. But as as I got older, it got worse because now I know how to process it, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to understand it. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to, like, everything just shut down. So how how you're saying, like, there was never, I always felt like there was never a moment to decompress. Mm-hmm. It was always on the go, on the go, on the go. Never, could never decompress. And it got to a point where it was, to me, in my, in my opinion, it was too late. I was like, man, I dug my hole too deep. I need to figure out this. I need to figure out the way. So the whole beginning, the beginning of this whole channel podcast was, all right, let's help other people with, with the stories that we personally went through. So it was about mental health, men's mental health, relationships, and it still is, right? Because we all, we throw it out there, we have fun, but reason why when we were, when we were out and I, I asked you, I was like, dude, it's because you are literally in this field. Mm-hmm. You're dealing with it day in, day out mm-hmm. for the past three years, and it's like, all right, well, let's hear it from somebody that's really in that industry. Yeah. And just to kind of piggyback off of what you said, unfortunately, in, you know, Hispanic community, in Mexican community, men are kind of taught at a very young age that you suppress those feelings. Even women, you're taught that you have to suppress those feelings. So I understand if you didn't have time to actually process any of that. That is like normal in our culture, unfortunately, but it's never too late. I'll say that. I know you think it's too late, but it's never too late to actually be able to process like what's happened and to allow yourself to feel that. So like in your last podcast with Ashley, you said, how is it to be in tune with your feelings? It's knowing that like, if you're having a conversation with someone and something's triggering you, you're getting upset, you're getting angry, something's coming up for you. So being in tune with your feelings is being able to say, you know, something's coming up for me right now. How can I handle this? So I don't, you know, push that onto the person or to, you know, push those negative feelings onto that person. So that's being more in tune with your feelings and it takes time. And I'll say that. And I've been in my own therapy for the last, I want to say eight months and it still takes me time. It's a work in progress to be able to decompress and to kind of process what happens. Finding, finding the balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now it's it's fun taking it from the pot, another one, but switching gears. Mm -hmm. So what, did you see yourself doing this since you graduated high school or like midway through college? You were like, all right, this is what I want to do. So we have dreams, right? As a <laughs> high elementary, what do you want to yes. be when you grow up? Stuff like, was this somewhere in, in the books? So I actually always wanted to work with kids and I always wanted to be a teacher, but my mom always said, you know, las maestras no hacen mucho dinero, están dejando ir a las maestras ahorita, which means like, Teachers were being cut at that time, and unfortunately, right? So she would always push something for, like, the medical field because that's what she's in, and she always pushed for that. And I was yeah. like, no, I don't want to be a doctor. No, I don't want to do any of that. And so my family comes from a family, and this is going to be me being very transparent. We come from a family where, unfortunately, depression is very prevalent. So it is passed down through the generations. My grandmother, my mother, um, you know, siblings as well. So depression is very much there. And so I kind of always knew I wanted to work with kids, but my mom was always like, no, 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 like go to like the medical field. And I didn't want to. So when I went to community college, I went to Pasadena City College. I started learning like psych 101. I was like, I like this stuff. I like how the mind works. This is all so interesting. But like I said, I swore to myself that I would never go into the clinical side because I was like, dude, you hear stories about like people dying, therapists dying, like clients being like, I hate this word crazy and I apologize younger, younger me for using that word a lot. Now I realize I shouldn't use that as a, a word so much cause it's, there's a stigma behind it. So somewhere along college, I was like, you know what? I want to get into the field of psychology. So I got 
three different degrees at Pasadena City College, and one was an AAT um, in psychology. And I transferred to Cal State Northridge, where I got my BA in psychology. And then it took me a while to find a job in this in this field. So it, it was weird. I went into ABA, which is like kind of similar, kind of different. It's applied behavior analysis. So if anyone who's out there that does that, I give you props because that's not an easy field. It's working with kids who are on the spectrum or just have disabilities. So along in that process, I was there for about like, I was at a company for about three months that my cousin started. It was a brand new company. It was up and coming. I got hired on as a supervisor, which was making some pretty good money. I was like, cool. I was working at a hospital. This job's going to offer me something more. I knew at the time Justin was also looking for a job. So we hired him on. We hired a bunch of people. My brother was working there. Cousins were working there. In the end, we got screwed over by one of the guys. He's giving you the, the seven minute mark, I think. What, a seven? <laughs> So seven All right. minutes left. <laughs> so, we good, we good. So along in that process, you know, some all of unethical things that happened, we all got let go. We were all out on the streets. I remember like being so sad, crying. I was like, damn, what am I going to do? And so my cousin's ex-girlfriend was like, hey, why don't you come apply for this company? And I was like, crazy, that's the same company that helped out my brothers when we were younger. And I was like, and it was the company that I have been at and so I was like okay um I had no idea what I was getting myself into so I applied at the Pasadena location which is like zero to five so I was like oh I'm gonna work with babies I'm excited I didn't hear anything back and I was like oh my god I'm nervous I need a job I'm not hearing anything back I get a phone call from my supervisor now <laughs> and he goes hey we've seen your resume floating like in the system we really like you would you like to come in for an interview and I was like yeah sure I remember I went in, I was like, I really want this job. And Justin's like, just just let them know at the end, like when they ask you like any final questions, you say, when do I start? And I was like, <laughs> I can't sound so confident. Like, what the heck? Yes. <laughs> My stupid Lay self. Lay brick. Yes. Lay brick. He laid lots of bricks for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I am laughing because at the, I had to do a Spanish test too. And so I had to interpret and show that I had – knowledge in medical terminology, which I worked at the hospital, so I knew, and I, I'm fluent in Spanish, and so I was like, okay, cool, and so then at the end, my supervisor goes, and he, he wasn't my supervisor then, but he goes, any final questions, and I was like, yeah, when do I start, and he laughs, and he goes, well, we had to interview a few other people, so I'll let you know by Friday, and I was like, dang, man, I don't think I got it. Stay tuned for laying a break, <laughs> our audience wanted to take shots because we're a little nervous. I'm not nervous. The audience is nervous. Come on the, in. The audience and me. Woo, <laughs> here we go. A special appearance. The DD. <laughs> well, not so My much manager. DD anymore, right? Designated drunk driver. <laughs> <laughs> DD. <laughs> we don't. No, that I'm one's just that's kidding, a family. lot. I'm just kidding, fam. That's a lot. No, it's not. We're all nervous. Oh my god, that smells horrible. Don't smell it. It smells really good, actually. We're not sponsored by them, but it smells really good. Toast to life. It toast to life. Toast to life. There life. it is. There it is. Watch episode twenty-six. <laughs> and he's out. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Thank you Justin. That was that I segment was just for him. Ugh. I hate you. Ooh, laying a break. Uh. Newport. Mm. We're going to have to have our own episode for the recap on Newport. Oh, gosh. Not a lot of us, not a lot of them remember what happened. <laughs> so, you, when you left that interview, you said, when do I start? They said, we need more interviews. How did, is that something you normally would do? Or it was just like in the moment confidence? In the moment, it just happened. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so stupid. Why would I even say that? And like, I just remember he laughed and... He's like, well, we have a few other people we have to interview, so we'll let you know by Friday. And that was Tuesday, mind you. So I was like, dang, I don't think I got it. I was a little too confident. And then I got the call the next day, and I got the job. <laughs> so I was like, oh, dang, okay. I was there for the last two years. So when you, when you got the job, when you got the call, how did that make you feel? The only reason I'm asking is because when I got a call, and it said literally interview two days, ago, two days prior, they said, we, we need two weeks because we still need to interview more people mm -hmm. for the same position. I was like, all right, two weeks. Damn, I hate waiting. I'm very impatient. Mm -hmm. Brittany will vouch that I'm very, <laughs> very, very impatient because I want it. When I want it, I want it now. Anyways, so 
two days later, got a call. They were like, look, we're going to go with you. We're not posting it yet, but we want to let you know you got it. Nice. So, mind you, I was, I was at my mom's and went into the restroom, sat down, and I was just like crying. I was like, what the fuck? Like, what did I... This is, this is great. And I was like, all right, well, shit, now I'm here because I've never done this. So, mm-hmm. now I'm here. Let's get to work. Mm-hmm. So, when you got that call, did, you, did it make you feel a certain way or is there a moment besides this one that when you got an opportunity you're just like this is what i was meant for or this is what i prepared for so when i got the call i was super happy i had been working a really great job so it was a huge pay cut so in that sense it was very unfortunate that i was taking this huge pay cut but unfortunately that's the reality of you know anything that's contracted through la county unfortunately we are very much underpaid um so i was happy in the moment um But when I first went in, I was like, okay, what the heck am I going to do? I don't know what to expect. And so all of this was all new to me. But I just ended up having like this rewarding feeling after like meeting these teens. Because I was, in particularly, I was hired to work with teenagers and do group therapy. So I was working alongside, excuse me, sorry, that was the shot that's gross <laughs> it's like right here in my throat in my esophagus um no but um I was working alongside different clinicians I didn't know what to expect um I was still learning so I definitely made some mistakes in the beginning but there was one point where I was just like this is what I want to do and I remember always hearing people talk about grad school how like it's scary it takes a toll on you it's time consuming and I was like oh dude I can never do grad school like if I was able to apply to like a community college and then to undergrad and not know how to even do it because I'm first generation to ever do this in my family, my brothers didn't do it. Yeah. yeah Shout out to everyone who's first Shout generation out, out there. It's it's not easy and I can vouch for you. It is difficult. So for you to apply to school, apply for financial aid, um, that was a difficult process. So when it came to grad school, I was like, mm, grad school? Like, no, that's not for me. And then I kept hearing like my coworkers say like, oh, I'm going to apply to grad school. Oh, I want to do it. I want to be a doctor. And I was like, well, you know what? Like, if they can do it, like I can do it too. So randomly one night, I'm like only like, I want to say four or five months into working at this new job. Just for fun, I like go and look at my supervisor's like alma mater. And so I'm like, well, I'm just going to look at information. I just sign myself up to look at information. The next day I get a phone call. Hey, do you want to take a look at the tour on campus? And I was like, sure. After the tour, they're like, all right, so you need to apply by this date and this date. And I was like, wait, what? And I was just like, okay. So it was all, excuse my language, shits and giggles. (laughs) And next thing you know, like they were like, okay, like you need to apply by this time. This was like maybe October, November. And they ended up telling me like, okay, um, you need to come to a group interview. And I was like, oh, dang. Okay. So you kind of like want to show out that you know what you're talking about. You know what you're doing in this field already. So I remember it was a group interview with five other people. Out of those five people, four of us are in the program now. Um, and oh, shit. yeah, they told us, hey, you're going to know by before Thanksgiving if you got accepted or not. So this all happened within like two weeks and I got accepted. And now I'm going into my final year of grad school and I I never imagined a little little brown girl like me would end up making it this far in life so shout out to young me you made it you're making it in life so I definitely say that I love that yeah you know and now so it's crazy because I can have these conversations that we have here I can have them normally with people that I'm I'm close to Mm -hmm. mind you when we came back from gym at 8 in the morning right 8 in the morning (laughs) So we had like a two two hour workout and I'm just talking with Josh and it was and I told him I was like, Do you ever and this is to anybody that's watching this at this point, right? Look at the camera. Anybody that's watching this, <laughs> like, do you ever just look in the mirror and just tell yourself, like, man, you did it. You came this far. So transferring into that, like dealing with, you know, negative people, negative people around that don't want to see you go to school, get a better job, get a better career. And I was and I asked them and I'll ask and everybody just needs to ask themselves this question. Are you happy or proud of how far you came? Hell yeah. Oh my god. Yes. Mm. Um 
if I could talk to a younger me, like childhood me, she would probably be so confused as to like what was going to come in life. Um, a lot of parts of my childhood, I feel, are, I feel are kind of blurry, so I don't really remember much. Um, mm. But if I could go back and like talk to younger me, I'd be like, you're, you're going to be very proud of yourself and like what you've done. Your parents are going to be extremely proud of you. Everyone around you is going to Oof, get a little emotional, man. But yeah, it's just, it's a nice feeling to know that like all the hard work you've put in, like even though you've lost people like down the road, like it pays off in the end and it's going to pay off. Like eventually like I've told Justin, like I want to go down the line of private practice. I don't know if after my master's I'll go for a doctorate. So maybe in three years, y'all will see me being a doctor. Who knows? Um, We're here to see it. Yeah. You know, like that's so, man, you literally took the question out of my mouth, like <laughs> talking to a younger self, mm-hmm. talking to the younger generation. This is why I personally love where I'm at, because like even at the gym, talking to younger guys like, bro, how'd you get so this? I'm like, bro, it's taking a lot. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. And trust me, I fell off. Mm-hmm. I had to lose myself to really find myself once again. Mm-hmm. And how we said earlier in the first part, like learning and it was literally learning the balance. Right. Right now, I'm. I'm still learning. And I think if you're not learning every day, every week, every month, you're just wasting time because there's Mm -hmm. always something new to learn. Maybe not about the world, but about yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shit that can happen in your life that Mm -hmm. you can uh, put it off to the side, put it off to the side. And then once it really hits, it hits and it hits hard. Losing friends, losing family members, relationships, getting out of relationships, Mm -hmm. friends and girlfriends and boyfriends. Finding yourself, and I said it and I said it again, if you can't love yourself and take care of yourself, how can you expect to really love somebody else? And I'll challenge you real quickly on that because although a lot of people in society has taught us to think that way, it's actually, you can actually be loved while you're still trying to figure out who you are. Um, I'll take myself an example. Again, I'm being transparent. I have gone through some difficult times in the last few years. I have come up on top. I have hit rock bottom. I have, you know, even gained a lot of weight. I have lost a lot of weight in that process. Love the gym. Transformation. I've done three different transformations. So I've done like ten. (laughs) Yeah. It's no big deal. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, yeah, it's a difficult process, but I mean, you do come out on top, and like. Justin would probably vouch for me too that he's seen me like go through these different chapters in my life and has seen me like grown and has loved me even in that process. So I'm letting you all know like, yes, it's important to love yourself before you can love others, but letting you all know too, you can also still be in a relationship or have friendships while you're still learning who you are and growing as a person. So I want you to always remember that too. Like people can still love you regardless for this different season that you're going through in life and it's kind of like how you mentioned earlier about how we kind of change right and it's like people say like oh you've changed you switched up you're not the same no more you know it's the part of life right if we're not changing like the seasons then what are we doing we're just sitting back and being normal and just being like at the bare minimum we should always be growing and changing whether that's learning different coping skills learning different communication skills learning more about yourself what triggers you what's coming up for you feelings emotions you know you should always be growing and learning about yourself and people should still love you in that process regardless. Damn. Facts. Amber hitting the freaking <laughs> facts, bro. You know, and that's what I love, right? When others, the people that come on the show and they ask or they correct something, mm-hmm. I am not knowledgeable enough to know a lot of shit, right? But you're I'm learning. Still, I'm learning, mm-hmm. right? After this, I'm going to rewatch this, cut the tape, and I'm going to listen. I'm like, damn, that's... I never knew that, right? Mm-hmm. Leaving out of here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, damn, I never knew that. So going off of this, you, what well, you, your little segment of the last like ten minutes, I love it. <laughs> Three top qualities that you, you yourself can say about yourself, like, hey, I'm Amber, and I bring this, this, and this. I asked Ashley, and she was like, uh, she said it, but I want to, I want to know about. What is Amber? Who is Amber? What does she bring? Well, I'm Amber. I bring empathy first. I'm always very empathetic and trying to be understanding of where a person is coming from, why they're acting a certain way. I'm patient. I have lots of patience. I'm sorry to my family sometimes. I always don't always have patience for you guys. I love you guys. 
but I have a lot of patience. Um, and it doesn't take a lot for me to get out of character. Uh, so I'm just very, very patient and I'm a loving person. So I wear my heart on my sleeve. My emotions are always there. You can always see it. So I'm very loving and very much giving of my love to everyone else and wanting to put everyone else before myself, but I'm now learning to put myself as well. So yeah, I would say I'm empathetic, I'm patient and I'm loving. And that's what I bring to the table each time. Damn, I love it. So now transferring the way and how you said you, you watched Ashley's Mm -hmm. what's happening right now with the whole, um, attacks on women, Mm -hmm. people putting down women, shout out to Cindy. When we had her episode, I think it was like 12, 11, something around there. Right. And we're talking about girls in business and how society men, particularly, I don't know why, but we tend to want to shut that down. Mm -hmm. Do you think men feel like we're losing the pants when a girl shows that power or that potential? I think so. I think because like in society nowadays, men are supposed to be perceived as being like this very masculine person. And I, not just in society nowadays, this has always been like a taboo thing. It's like untold rule. You said right? Like his, coming from Hispanics. Yeah, especially thing. in Hispanic households. There's machismo. Machismo is very much very existent, like you talked about with Ashley. Yeah. The men are treated very much differently than the women are. So for a woman to come in and be very empowering, it can be intimidating for a lot of men to be like, oh, okay, this girl knows what she's doing. She has her shit together. You know, She either has an education or doesn't or is like a badass and like has her own like job or business, right? So it can be definitely intimidating for some gentlemen. I'll say that, but you think it's intimidating for women also? For I think so. Other women? Oh yeah, definitely. I can definitely see that. Um, I personally, I have been told that I'm an intimidating person, but I usually don't see men as being intimidating. I feel like it's just like for show, like yeah. you're just gonna puff up your chest and just like be this macho guy. Do you think that yeah. like I always say, walk with confidence. Mm-hmm. Show who you are, and when you come into the room, people know who you are. Whether there's, it's a room full of uh, business people or a room full of people in fitness, or it doesn't matter what room you come into. When you come out, you show out. Mm-hmm. And it's not on no, easiest word, on no cocky level, right? Because I think when you say the word cocky, it's just you're putting down other people around you. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it, like, oh, hi, look at my muscles, boom. You don't got any, so you're not even allowed to be here. It's like, whoa, mm-hmm. whoa, whoa, whoa. My Donald's diet and lifting what I lift, it's like, yeah, I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. But I think where this world is right now is like nobody wants to see anybody win. Every, nobody wants to, like how we had it with, with Justin. We had it with Josh. Mm-hmm. I just talked about it with Josh. Uh, Ashley talking about her family, uh, her part, the party rentals. It's like nobody wants to see you really succeed Mm -hmm. until you really succeed. Then I supported you. Right. Mm -hmm. How we just said at the beginning of this, everybody's like, nope, this person, this is this, this, you're this, you're that. It's like, well, get to know me. Mm -hmm. Really understand who I am. Yep. Like how you said, how you just said earlier, like you're, you listen and where people are coming from to understand them. But it's like, bro, I can't hate on you until I really understand. And if you're negative, go ahead, keep moving. Mm -hmm. But when stuff like that happens, it's like, all right, why are you like this? What's happening in your life that you just... That you're projecting onto me, which is what I feel goes back into being in tune with your feelings and your emotions. Like, if you know what's going on with you internally or if something's coming up for you, then learn how to work on that yourself so that you don't project that onto something else because that's the one thing that I've tried to really learn to do is not take it personal when someone's like giving me an attitude or being rude towards me or even a client is telling me I don't know aren't you the professional aren't you the therapist well first of all no I'm not the therapist and you know I would appreciate if we toned down the attitude a little bit but then I'm like you know what something's happening at home something's happening internally and I can't even be mad about that because you don't know how to process that yet so you don't know how to not project that onto me. And I've learned, you know, don't take that personal. If someone's like trying to flip you off on the road, that person's probably in a hurry, you know, let them go. (laughs) Right. They're just project. I mean, I'm I'm definitely there all the time. (laughs) You know, and 
today, particularly, like, something external happened. But I remember what I personally said week before, episode before. Mm -hmm. Do not let the clown have the circus. Mm -hmm. Let the, well, sorry, don't be a part of the circus and let that clown have a show. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, I can't fall into this. People, they want to, they want to, it's. They want to get wanna, a reaction out of you. Exactly. So even got home, Brittany asked, like, hey, did you, nope, I don't need to no more. Mm -hmm. I said what I said. Good luck to you. If you don't like me, don't shake my hand when you see me. Don't even come at, go ahead. Good luck to you. That's it. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the biggest thing, right? Don't let those people see the reaction or let them win by you giving that reaction because people live off of that. So mm -hmm. is there a specific or many or maybe many events? Did you have to go through anything like that? Did you have to live through that? In, oh, yeah. in your lifetime? Oh, yeah. For example, we have Hispanic parents, Mexican parents, right? How many times don't they, like, get on your ass about, like, the simplest things, right? Or just, like, they start telling you something, then walk away, and then come back and keep telling you something, and, like, walk away, and, oh, I'm not done. I'm going to keep telling you something else. It's like, let me not act out of character. Let me not get pissed off about, like, yeah. what's happening right now. So, yeah, and I'm going to be honest, that still happens at home. It's... You know, it's common. It's common in these households. It's yeah. common in our culture for this to happen, to kind of just bite your tongue and not say anything because you're being disrespectful to your mom and dad. And that's why I love being able to be in this field and work on breaking intergenerational cycles, as we call them. I love my culture. I'm sure everyone else does, but I'm sure we're also learning to break the stigma, break the culture of mental health in Hispanic households and not let that be passed on or triggered onto our children. And I'm very much working on that myself right now in my own therapy so that I yeah. eventually, if the day that I'm blessed with kids, I don't pass that on to them and then we can have great open communication about How many things. kids do you want in your life? <sighs> Three to four. <laughs> Three to four. <laughs> this is where the camera zooms in. <laughs> oh, fool, you said four, no? Four. Yeah, see? He, like he, <laughs> he like said four. Down. Let me tell you, my boy Justin, on camera, two no, is hard. <laughs> it's a little hard, my it's boy. It's a hot corner. Oh, man. <laughs> Yep. Damn, four. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, you, okay. My body's already hurting thinking about that. I'm right, Brittany? <laughs> I'm going for... No, nah, I'm going for two, and I'm like, oh, Ooh. man. She wants lucky number three. I'm like, ah. Yeah. I mean, my family, we're three. We're, I don't know if you're three. We're three. He's four. They're four. Yeah. What are, you're the middle? I'm oldest? the middle child. You know, middle child... <laughs> Uh, so you're like actually uh, the forgotten one. Yeah. You're the well, forgotten not child. not forgotten one. It's kind of like, and if we go into some transparency part about all this again, yes, please, please, um, this, this is what it's about on this episode, bro. To bring it all full circle again about how I got into this field, my younger brother has a mental health diagnosis, and my older brother does too. Um, so growing up, there was a lot of tension needed on my younger brother to get him the help that he needed. And on the other mm -hmm. end, there was my older brother who was like always having trouble with his self-esteem, having trouble with like his anger. So there was also, he went down a really bad path where he was using a lot of drugs, unfortunately. And so it was just a bad time for him. So in that time, it's like my parents had to focus on my two brothers. And so I felt like I had to be the golden child where I wouldn't do anything wrong. I would like be on top of my grades and all of that because did I didn't want to get yelled at. I didn't want to get in trouble. I saw like how difficult it was for my older brother, how difficult it was for my younger brother. Um, and to continue with that transparency, one of the reasons why I got into this field is because there was a time where my oldest brother attempted to commit suicide, unfortunately. And I was 13 at the time, remember. I still remember it clearly. There's some parts that can get kind of foggy. But I remember being, uh, you know, 13 years old, um, and my brother waking up, uh, foaming to the mouth. He had, over di uh, he had overdosed on pills. Um, he was just in a really hard place and we had found like letters and notes after and so this is why I'm in the field that I'm in now because a lot of these kids need help and they don't have those resources so if I could go back to that time and like say hey I had all these resources like I could help you but I know like I was just a teen at the time I wouldn't be able to help but I remember those moments of yelling my parents freaking out 
trying to wake him up, me calling 911 at 13 years old. Imagine a 13 year old like calling the police, telling them like, hey, my brother's foaming to the mouth. Please come to this address. Like having to grow up real quick, like Ashley mentioned in that last one. It's yeah. it's hard. It is very hard. So there are things that bring it all full circle. And this is why I'm here because, you know, our kids need us. The future kids need us. Our children need us. And I'll definitely say that. Fuck. Yeah. I yeah, I I've know. thought about this topic a little bit, like early in the week, and I was like, and I'm not gonna cry. The, but it can it can be emotional. So I, honestly, like, let me. Yeah. I I really want to piggyback. How how old is your other brother? He just turned. He'll be 34 on Monday. 34. Happy yeah. early birthday, bro. Happy yeah. early birthday. Um, <clears throat> reason being is because my my mom's younger brother, oh my uncle, uh, he suffered through depression and he's he is a sensitive one always sensitive right mama's boy um he i remember very very eh, i would say kind of foggy right because i remember he went to a rehab center in santa barbara Mm -hmm. um i don't really remember which one exactly but i remember we went to santa barbara one time and i didn't know him I probably didn't sink in then, but he came and uh, we we're everybody enjoying it. And I was like, man, like this is so dope, right? He's mm-hmm. here. We, I know we, we went to see him, but I didn't really know why. Yeah. Now that I'm older, I found out really why we were there. Um, and he was on a, on a path, on a path to recovery, finding himself, loving his kids, his three kids. Um, you know, it's just. How we talked about earlier, I didn't know how to handle it, mm-hmm. and what you just said right now it just it just triggered mm-hmm. because he was in that position to getting better. Wrong place, wrong time, shit happened, and it was like fuck, man. Like how you said earlier, and this is why, like when I got that call for this job, the reason why I cried was I wish I could tell you mm-hmm. because I know you're all about sports. I wish I can really talk to you about this. Winning the first uh, championship, league championship, getting to CIF, second league championship. I was like, I, w- I really wish we can have this conversation. Mm-hmm. I can't, but how they said, oh, you could talk to him. I know, he'll listen, right? But re- after that, it was more, I'm doing this because, how you said, I wish I was old enough and more mature enough to understand and be able to be there. I wasn't really there because I was working. I was working at at the phone with Ashley, making money, living good, and I was like, "Oh, this is." I never. I didn't understand it. Didn't want to understand it. And I was just. I didn't value it the way mm-hmm. I am now. So what you just right now is like, bro, like. That's crazy. That's almost similar, and blessfully, your brother's still here, about to celebrate thirty four. Yes. And so it's like, man. You know, he went through some difficult times. I'll say that he, in his letters that he wrote, he had low self-esteem. He questioned God. Where was God at the time? And so it was a dark place for him. And we didn't know. So that was the tough part about it. But now I'm so thankful that he's in such a great place now. He has an amazing wife. He found someone that absolutely loves him. So I love her for treating him so good because, you know, for a long time it, it was hard for him. You don't know unless you're a part yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. You really have to be in those shoes to understand. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> oh, let's, let's take that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, let's take the break. We'll be, we'll right be back. back. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get a shot. Don't worry, Justin. We're gonna get a shot. At the end. That's it. This is it. I know, you we know? got 10 minutes. Hey, people, people lasted this long, bro. Ten you have the longest. Episode 26. I had four shots. We had four shots. Hey, episode 26 Ten. is the longest. Really so it's either four we... Shots, then you were drinking the, the, the tall one. Oh, yeah. I know. So Ooh. we're drinking... Yeah. People think we're drinking alcohol. We're not drinking. We're drinking water. All day. Shots. Water. Shots. All day. It's a positive. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. But so I want to bring it up. I just told you I'm going to bring it up. You started a new page. Ooh, yes. This is something I've been wanting to do for a while. Name, why, and what's your plan with it? The reason I did it is because, well, first of all, I've 
been saying I want to do it for a while, but I just don't ever have the time because with going to school full time and working full time, it becomes hard. And like having night classes for school, it's kind of hard to balance that and social media can become a little heavy. So yeah. right now with going to internship, I have to move down to part time, unfortunately, I'm taking another huge pay cut, unfortunately. So that leaves me with a lot of free time. So I thought I always want to promote myself as a business. I don't know much about business stuff, but you know, me a lot of people who are close in this circle. We know, know about somebody. That stuff, we so. know somebody. So I finally decided I would promote it as like myself as a business. Unfortunately, with the law and ethics that go behind community mental health or just psychology in general, like as a social worker, MFT, as a PCC, whatever you, psychology, psychiatrist, they can get very black and white. So unfortunately with that, I had to be very careful about how I promote myself because yeah. I'm not a therapist just yet. Just yet. Wait so on it. Give me a year. So in a year I'll have my number and I should be doing therapy by a year. But unfortunately, um, on this new page, I cannot provide therapy for y'all, unfortunately. Nah. I cannot give advice through DMs. Unfortunately, I can get in huge trouble if that were to happen if someone wants to report me to the board one day. So... Yeah, there's a lot of black and white with that. But that's only because of where you're at now? Yes, because I'm going to become a trainee. I'm going to become an intern. Mm. Um, even if I wasn't yes. an intern, I could get in huge trouble. Even because I have that title behind like my Instagram name, I could get in trouble with the board if they wanted to. What? So that's it right now. My page is just based on what I've learned as like a mental health worker, case manager. So it's skill building. Yeah. In a year, I'll be putting more like diagnoses and all that gotta, stuff. When you got to put a social media influencer. Ooh. Ooh. No. Yeah. Those people can be kind of something else. No. <laughs> so when we start Started, right and even after we like episodes in like that was one thing right mm -hmm. and it was about who you are on and off camera that's yes. the biggest thing yes so like this is what you're saying it's like well like uh shout out to to jackie and to the cause she's trying to be or is now a life coach motivational people motivating people mm -hmm. because that's what it is about mm -hmm. it's about helping others through your, through your energy, through your power, through the way you communicate to others, and through your like experiences, experiences, mm -hmm. yeah, because I've I'm big on it. Like I can cuss, like there's no tomorrow. Oh, same. But yeah. you know me, your audience, right? Yes, like, but to me, it's like I talk the way I talk to get my message out. Mm -hmm. This is how I feel. It's a different if I talk in this tone compared to if I talk in a louder. And this is like. Throwing a word in, it's like, bro, now you know I mean it. Mm -hmm. This is what I am. This is what it is. This is what I'm about. Oh, yeah, I believe you. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay. You interpreted what I, want, what I wanted to tell you. Mm -hmm. But that's crazy. Like, not crazy, but, you know, where you're going, I mean, you just need to do things a certain way. Move a certain way. Do things to the book so you can get to. Yeah, it's also to cover ground for me and so I don't get in trouble. So right now what I'll be posting is a lot of like, and just being interactive with whoever follows me. Um, what do you want to learn about mental health? What is it that you've gone through in your struggles? What is it that you've grown and have had experiences like growing up? Um, I just kind of want to put it out there. This is like a safe space for everyone to come to. Um, we can have more open conversations through comments. Unfortunately, through DMs we can't. And if you go through any like, professional page like of a therapist like a social worker a psychiatrist like just anyone you will notice that on their bios it says like no advice through dms because you can get in huge trouble for that kind of stuff so in the future i do look to become a business myself but i need to complete three thousand hours for therapy first um this was an hour and 10 minutes yeah. maybe 15 who knows yeah 3,000 hours. I have to complete that in two, two and a half years, which is which is kind of hard to do. So in two years, I can become licensed. There's exams that come with that, too. I have to upkeep with that. And I'm doing a duo master's program. So I'm actually getting two masters right now with an emphasis in trauma. So in the future, um, I hope that I can promote myself as a business and that this can just be my career and my future because that's what I want it to be. I want to not have to work a nine to five. I want to be there for if I have future kids, if I have, like, you know, my future husband. Um, so I just want to mm -hmm. shout no. out to my manager. Sh you know, shout out. <laughs> if the shoe fits. 
Justin Reyes, <laughs> if the ring fits. Wait, so weird. we asked Ash, are oh, you yes. going to propose or no. is he is? He's told me very much. If I do that, he would like smack that ring out of my hand. <laughs> He's like, don't get on one knee. <laughs> I mean, imagine like Brady, like just getting down on one knee and you're like towering over her. And she's going to be like, oh, it's kind of like how she like, said John would, re- John would respond, right? <laughs> Don't make a scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a conversation. Because she she's, she's asked her, me. Say no on yeah, yeah, she was like, she would ask me, like, what if I just proposed to him? Like, no, that's not Don't the way it's it. supposed to be. I mean, that's an open, like, conversation. Like, one thing I talk about in relationships as a marriage and family therapist in the future, communication is key. Yeah. I didn't have that in this current relationship that I'm in in the beginning. Uh, we didn't have that, but we've grown together and we openly communicate about what bothers us when we need space, when we need to just decompress. If I, because I can be very much the type of person to push buttons, <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag, I'm just kidding. Um, but communication is very important in yeah, that. So, super. Like, if you're talking about marriage and all that stuff, I mean, obviously you both are on the same page for something greater in life to yeah. create a family. You both obviously already have like your household, your children. I'm sure that will come later on down the line. So, but yeah. it's an open conversation that you both, I imagine, have. Yeah. Correct? Well, you need to have them, right? Like, yeah. regardless. And I was telling Josh, like, bro, what I say in the podcast, I'm not telling you go get pregnant, have a family, get inspired by them. It's like, you know, sometimes. It, just, it happens, right? We know the repercussions of the actions. Mm-hmm. Some people, and how Ashley Martinez said it, some people are made for it. Unfortunately, some people are not. But that's just how life is, sadly, unfortunately. But when it comes, I mean, we know people, I know people that uh, were hard. It was hard for them to get mm-hmm. pregnant. It was harder than for mm-hmm. even half kids. Even my parents, I remember a weird conversation that was. But... You know, it was weird. It was hard, but it's like when it happened with us, like maybe TMI, but it was like, bro, like it wasn't happening at the beginning. We're like, dude, like mm-hmm. something is wrong. Something is wrong. And then mm-hmm. boop, two kids later, nothing's wrong. Yeah. We're good. But like, <laughs> but to like add on to that, like shout out to like both of you, for example, because it's hard to be able to raise kids. It's hard in a pandemic with this crazy world that we're living in. I'm using yeah. the word crazy because the world can be a little, you know, hectic. It can hectic. be hectic. Unfortunately, you know, we raise our sons to be able to respect women. We raise our daughters to be able to be safe of what's around them and their surroundings. So I'm sure that both of you will instill that into your children in the future. And yeah. it's not an easy job. So I give you both props because I work with parents, young parents, older parents, and it is not easy. So it I give you tough. both props, especially having to work full time, you know, maintain your house, put food on the table, keep the roof over your house, the clothes on your back. Yeah, It's not easy. So shout out to these parents right here. I got to say that. Thank you. Shout out to the mom. The mom. Shout out to the mom. Shout out to yeah. the mom. I, Moms carry the baby. They, Man. They, I oh, I was just tell, I was just telling my dude. I was like, bro, like, I do a lot and I grind. I grind like there's no tomorrow. But the mom is the one that's more compassionate, more heartfelt. She has an attachment. Like again, we talked about Newport. She cried on the way to Newport. She's like, man, I left. I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, let's 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 let go. Let's have fun. But in the back of my head, I'm like, man, he is crying. Damn, that's yeah. crazy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, shout out to the moms, to the moms in relationships and single moms. Exactly. And dads being single dads mm-hmm. that are both, playing both, everybody. But if you watch the podcast, Amber, there's always a last question. Ooh, what scale am I on? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's <laughs> it's like this uh this uh what's that um oh we're we're about to do a p- full full i had two i'm good at this kind of stuff <laughs> just because i did better than episode 26 <laughs> to be spe- specific right now specific <laughs> never hating i love all my shows but this one's gonna be the best one right you say that on every show, so. But everyone, we get better because I have to analyze. I'm like, man, I cringe. I look at myself. I'm like, all right, stand up better, sit up better, drink better. 
<laughs> work out more because <laughs> you need to get buff. But shout out to my trainer today. You know, we have two guys that sh- trained. Well, I trained them, but <laughs> <laughs> but one through ten. We're this episode, man. It was a lot about mental health, a lot yes. of knowledge that you dropped on us, and dude, amazing. You personally, and it's the financial, the mental, um, emotional. Where are we at? In a one to ten scale, and then an overall. So right now, financially, I'm gonna be at a low number. I want to say maybe four to five, just because I'm going down a part time. Mm-hmm. I'm taking a huge pay cut as an intern. You know, a lot of places don't pay you for interning. You got to do that stuff for free. Luckily, uh, my agency pays you. It's not the best, but they're paying. So too. I'm gonna struggle for the next few months. I don't know what that's gonna look like. Um, I have some fear in that sense. So. I'll be like at a four to five. I've tried to pay off all my credit cards so that I can just focus on what is needed yeah. in these next few months. So that's at a low number. I had to be honest about that. Um, as far as like mental health wise, I would say maybe like right now I'm at an eight or nine. That's because I go to my therapy. I'm working on myself. Can't say I'm at a 10 because there's always like room for improvement. I go to my weekly therapy. He's mouthing something <laughs> on the side and I don't know what it is because I'm looking at y'all. <laughs> We're right here. She's spending the message to you guys. So yes. listen the fuck up. <laughs> I'm like at an eight or nine, I want to say, because there's Love always it. room for improvement. I go to my therapy. I normalize therapy, feelings, validating, all that Love stuff. It. So I'm about, about there. And then um, mm. emotional-wise, oh, I'm very in tune to my emotions. So I'm 10. I'm a very emotional being in person, as you all probably saw earlier. Was I was like, ooh. Let's just make sure the phone's not cracked. Hey, there you go. Okay. <gasps> no. <laughs> The emotion, 10. 10, and yeah. I don't, very... I don't think we've added this, but since you went through your your body changes, physical, the Ooh. confidence, where are we at? 1 to 10. Confidence, not there right now. I've been like eating whatever I want, which I'm going to normalize. It's okay, ladies, to eat whatever you want. It's okay if you fall off the horse. You know, when it's time to get back on the horse again, uh, you mouthing words over here, okay? <laughs> this is my show. <laughs> Episode 28. <laughs> Mind you. So this is the Amber show. Not even a toast. <laughs> a Amber, a toast to life. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm a big goofball. But I'll say, uh, physically wise, I need to get back on it, which I'm going to have a lot of downtime now. So I'm probably going to be like dropping a lot of weight pretty soon since I'm going back into the gym, starting to lift heavy. I've had some injuries here and there. Unfortunately, as you get older, bones start to crack. <sighs> starting to have some arthritis in the shoulder. So people, as you get old, man, things start to hurt. But... No, um, I want to say maybe like like I'm at a six or a seven. Be better, what what com- what what word or phrase can you tell somebody that's low in confidence in her, their body? One phrase that I've stuck by since high school is give it to us. Um, it will all be okay in the end. If it's oh. not okay, it's not the end. Yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, mic drop, but don't drop the Boop. mic though. Don't no, drop no, the no, mic. No, 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 no. We're just, <laughs> we're suspensive. just imagining. <laughs> Boop. Man. Yeah. If it's not okay in the end. Oh. Yeah. Go it ahead. It will all be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Many times we go through difficult times in our life, different chapters in our life. We feel like we've hit rock bottom. You feel like it's not okay. It's not the end. Promise you, it gets better. Ask for help. Check in with people. Check in with your loved ones. Like People need it. Be there for their mental health. Be there for your loved ones. You never know what someone's going through behind the scenes. And on that, we'll be ended with another shot. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> with that phrase, how long and have you stuck by it and lived, and like lived by it? Because that's... That's a good one. Since my senior year. I was going to use that as like my senior quote, but I used a Bible verse instead. Um, I can't remember it right now. Oh, I was about to ask back on it. you. I'll look back on it because it was a very important one that I liked. But that one I really liked and I stuck by it because my senior year I was having some difficult times. Oh, chiquito. Ah, ah, ah. I'm just kidding. And I had a lot of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all the way up. Yeah. It's all no, the way up. <laughs> no, it is. She so, didn't say Stop. <laughs> That's definitely one I use since like my senior year, just because I strongly believe in that. Did yeah. have from then till now? Do you think you did the 
you did the right choice from everything you've done from high school and in high school because right i think for all the like under the kids that un, in high school that watch this man mm -hmm. i appreciate you guys but they from then to now i always tell them bro like go through your first year after high school you're gonna realize everything when mm -hmm. you lose friends you make new friends mm -hmm. you do new things you start a job you there's there's a change that's gonna happen you that you've gone you've gone through already high school you've gone through college your your bachelor's your master's you're going in all this do you think you already you've done enough or the right amount to be where you're at now no not yet there's still a lot of work that needs to be done especially in our communities so my goal is to be able to work with the teen population, um, foster children. I got a huge heart for foster children too. Absolutely love them. Little ones too. So I feel that the generations that are coming up are the future. And so it's our job in as adults to help fix yeah. these communities and help these children out. So I'm not complacent with where I'm at in, right now, but you know, in time. But you're going. I'm going to be something amazing, something great. <sighs> Mm -hmm. that's i appreciate you tears don't don't cry when you watch this episode i might <laughs> anyone else who watches this i hope it hits home comment like share subscribe <laughs> but amber thank you a thank toast you, to life you. cheers a big everyone one. here it is Oof. Ooh. what's your instagram shout it out instagram hurry up hurry up oh my god amber castro mft or Amberlina with two R's. Oh, we're gonna, man, that we're was gonna strong. we're gonna share them down below. Stay tuned. Like, share, subscribe, follow every single page on the links. Bye. Stay tuned.